Today on Skyrim Modeler's Haven, they said it couldn't be done. I take a Shelf of Doom build and move it to the Shelf of Success. Let's get to it. In part one of this Shelf of Doom rescue, I hit it with some primer, laid down the camo, striped up some missiles, and even faded the paint. So with all of this done, we've got a nice base to start the weathering. Be sure to check out part one of this build series to see how I get to this point. Being an Egyptian SAM-6 carrier, this tank would have spent most of its life in the desert. One of the easiest and most effective types of weathering is a simple wash. A basic wash using oil paints that you can find at any craft store will highlight a lot of the finer details as well as giving shadow to some of the deeper crevices. It takes your model from looking like a toy and starting to give it the depth and texture of something more than a toy. The first step in doing a wash is to protect the paint by coating the model in a gloss clear. You want to use a gloss finish instead of a flat clear as this allows the oil paint to run through capillary action all over the crevices and details of the model. It also lets you easily wipe away any excess wash that you may have or move the wash around with a brush. Since I'm going to be using oil paints which is enamel based, I use a clear coat that's acrylic based so that the thinners don't react with each other. This basic weathering technique works both for aircraft and armor and all I really did was take my experiences from using this on aircraft and move it over to this armor piece. You can watch another video I did on how I break down this process and use a pin wash to weather my B-17 build. The link is in the description. Alright, so what's next? How about some chipping? This being only the seventh armor model I've ever built, since I mostly build aircraft, I decided to experiment with some of the chipping effects on the bottom of the tank so that I don't screw up anything up where you're actually going to be able to see it. Using acrylic paints, I give myself a palette of tans, browns, yellow, and a dark charcoal black. The simplest form of chipping is with just a single color. Since I don't have to deal with any kind of rusty metals, I'm going with a dark charcoal black and all I do is using a fine point brush just try to touch different corners and edges of where I think the paint would have gotten chipped. You can also do paint abrasion chips where the chip hasn't completely gone down to bare metal but has slightly discolored the actual paint. By using a color several shades lighter than the base color, you can create this effect. The fun really begins when you combine these two effects. You can start by doing the paint abrasion effect and create an area of chipped paint. Then you follow up with the darker charcoal color and do a smaller area in the same part of the chipped paint. This creates an effect of the paint being chipped and exposing some of the metal below. Now if you were doing a tank in a theater that would get the metal rusty, you could go ahead and apply a rust color on top as well to create even a further chipping rusty effect. But for my purposes, this is as far as I'm going to go, so that I take my newly learned techniques and start to apply it all over the tank. I try to mix up these techniques by doing paint abrasions, bare metal chipped paint, and a combination of the two. Satisfied with the chipping, well, I may have taken a little bit too far, but that's okay, it was a lot of fun. It's time to move on to some of the final assembly. Ooh boy. All right, let's do this. Tracks. The tracks in this kit came as several individual links as well as sections of track. This being only the seventh piece of armor I've ever built, this was going to be a new challenge for me. After asking some of my modeling buddies and watching some other YouTube videos, I felt I was ready to tackle this. 
I started by experimenting with the placement of the track by just dry fitting everything and trying to place everything approximately where I think it would sag and go. When everything looked the part, now it was time to commit to some of the glue on the individual pieces of track and to form them around the sprocket and return bogey. Even with everything glued and dry, I knew that during final assembly, I would probably have to reshape some of these parts of the track slightly, but that's okay, they were malleable enough that I'd be able to deal with that when that time came. A simple little tip I found watching YouTube was to take a straight edge and put the individual tracks against it so I could make sure that they line up properly while I'm gluing them. Hey, this isn't looking too bad. I gotta admit, I was a little intimidated by this step, but once I got through it, and with all the help I found from both my modeling buddies and on YouTube, I felt pretty confident and I was able to get this done with a fair amount of accuracy. So now it's time to paint and weather these tracks. Let's start with that first step, painting them. I decided to do a little bit of experimentation with what I was going to paint the tracks. I wasn't sure what was gonna work and anything I didn't like, I could either paint over or weather over. The simplest thing to do when painting tracks is to do some type of a metallic color, or as I've even seen, just paint them black. But I wanted to see if I could do some kind of a combination or something in between. So I went with some metallic colors, some slightly rusty colors, just to kind of give it a little bit of a surface rust look, and even went with some darker charcoal colors. I always recommend experimenting, especially when you're trying out a new technique, just to see what you're gonna get. So is all of this worth it? Eh, I learned a lot. I even have some samples of some different colors of metallic paints. We'll just let the final results speak for themselves after the weathering. The last step in preparation for weathering the tracks was to hit all the tracks with a matte clear coat. And while I had it loaded in my gun, I went ahead and hit the model with the clear flat base as well. Sand and dust. Let's get this thing weathered up so it looks like we plucked it right out of the desert. I start with the tracks, but to make things even more interesting, I made an entire video on how I weathered these tracks from beginning to end with a couple of interesting techniques to get these looking nice and dusty as well as packed with sand. Check out that video that goes through the entire process step by step. As always, there's a link in the description. Hey, and if you feel like clicking around a little bit, do me a big favor and hit that like and subscribe button. Help me out with that YouTube algorithm. Thanks a lot. So there we go. Following the steps in that other video of how to weather the tracks, these are looking pretty good. So now we gotta get the rest of the tank, the wheels, and everything else on the model to match the tracks so everything looks nice and dusty and packed with sand. Now before I can dust up the tank, I've got to put the last remaining parts on it so that I can dust those at the same time so nothing looks brand new and shiny on top of all the dust and weathering I'm about to do. So let's get these pioneering tools on and no tank is complete without its tow cable. Using the same palette of pastel chalks that I used to do the weathering on the tracks, I'm going to use that same setup to do weathering on the rest of the tank, wheels, and undercarriage. The process is similar, but instead of using a fixer to get a wet surface to put the powders on, I'm putting everything on dry. When using a fixer along with the powders, it gives the effect of more of a packed up sand. It's great for the tracks, but not what I'm looking for for the rest of the tank. By applying the powders on the matte coated surface of the tank, it gives the appearance of more of a dusty look and allows that powder to collect in all the nooks and crannies of the tank so it looks like all that has been kicked up from the tracks. I put the powder on pretty heavy using an up and down motion for most of the tank but on the wheels and undercarriage I kind of put it on haphazardly just to get it nicely coated with a heavy dose of the powder. With everything looking nice and dusty it's now time to lock in all this hard work with another coat of the clear matte finish. The reason for the heavy coating of the weathering powder was that I was gonna lose some of it when I applied the matte finish. 
And I can't forget about the top surfaces, but I don't want to put powder on the top surfaces. Instead, I use Tamiya Buff and do a very light dusting with very thin paint, upwards of 90% thinner to paint. This gives a very similar effect as if I was using the powders, but because this is the top of the tank, it wouldn't have as much dust and sand as on the sides and bottom of the tank. I didn't like how much I lost in the dusty effect on the sides of the tank where I applied the powder and then coated it with the matte finish. So do I apply more powder and seal it in again? I decided to go with option two and apply more powder but not seal it at all. The effect is outstanding and really makes for a dusty look, but I can no longer handle the model on the sides of the tank as my fingers would pick up the dust and pull it off the tank. Not a big deal, I just got creative with the way I handled the tank and I put it on a base so I could move it around without having to touch it. I actually jumped ahead a little bit, so let's take a step back. Before doing the second coat of powder, I actually had to get the tracks installed. It was a delicate process with a lot of tweezers, checking, refitting, gluing, bending, and everything else that's required to get these tracks to look right. Once I was satisfied with the placement of the tracks, I went back in using the same weathering techniques that I did to weather those tracks to hide all the glue seams. And with that, my modeling friends, I present to you the Shelf of Doom Rescue, a Trumpeter 135th SAM-6 Missile Carrier. this video and were able to take away a few nuggets of tips and tricks for your next build. If you enjoyed this video, hey make sure you subscribe and like it as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts and get some feedback on this build. Is there something you'd like to see in the future? Maybe a specific build or some type of trick or technique? Hey drop a comment, let me know, and I'll see what I can do. Is there some product you saw me use in this video and you wish you could get your hands on? I got you covered and you can help me out at no cost to you. I put links in the description of all the products used in this video, and if you click on any of those links and make a purchase, I get paid a small commission from the seller at no cost to you. Thanks for helping me out. Don't forget to watch part one of this build series to see how I got this far, and check out some of my other videos for more helpful content. Thanks for watching.